Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our municipal series on the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from across this great country to talk about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today, we're heading to British Columbia. Actually, we're heading to the Vancouver Island to the city of Colwood to sit down with Colwood City Councillor Ian Ward. Councillor Ward, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Happy to be here. So, Ian, I want to start with the question I've asked every single politician on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, and that's a great question, Chris. I think for me, you know, I, I had to ask myself that question. You know, I, I felt it coming on, but uh, couldn't pinpoint it. And I think, you know, if I'm being fair, I've got to credit my mother, actually. So she's, you know, in her late 70s. Um, you know, suffers from an autoimmune disease. And, and many years ago, you know, she um, she started or, or helped pioneer an accessibility committee in her community, the Comox Valley, which is about two and a half hours north of me on Vancouver Island. Um, and, you know, was a, a strong advocate for, you know, for those in the community who, who needed a voice. And, uh, you know, as a result, was named one of the 100 citizens of the century in that community. And, you uh, you know, I, I saw that and thought, you know, in her position, it would be easy to sit on the sidelines and, and you know, and complain or, or point fingers or, or, you know, do nothing. And instead, you know, despite the, the challenges of, of her disability, she engaged and said, hey, I can make a difference. And, uh, you know, I think that resonated with me. Was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up or was politics something that came a little bit later? Because you, in that story, you talk about your mother. She gave back, but not through the political route. She may have given back through nonprofits, through organizations, you as well. Was politics something that was an interest of your family or are you sort of the black sheep of the family and got involved later on? No, politics was uh, ingrained in the fabric of our family from, from the early days. I'll be honest with you, you know, we... We sat down for dinner at 6 p.m. as the news came on, and my dad was very much, uh, you know, we need to to stay up to date on what's happening. So, for context, you know, both both my parents were involved politically, as you know, and, and sort of more on the the labor side. Um, father was a teacher, mother was a nurse, so active as as shop stewards and things like that. So, you know, naturally in, engaged in local politics and. You know, as, as kids are wont to do, you, you kind of follow your parents' interests. Um, that being said, you know, for a period of many years, I followed it out of general interest, but certainly not at a, uh, an engagement level. I've never been, for example, a formal, you know, party member at the provincial level or, or federal level. You know, I've always been more of a, a casual observer than a true participant. <laughs> so what happened then? What happens in 2022 that sparks you to say to yourself, now's the time now's the time that ian is going to get involved and put his name on the ballot because i could imagine while being an observer of politics getting involved is a, a unique beast in itself so what happened in 2021 or 2022 when the election happened that made you decide this was the time and now was your chance and why municipally and that's the big question in this statement why municipally Sure. Well, well, I think, you know, a couple of things. The, the first thing that happened to me happened to, well, literally everyone. <laughs> and that's COVID, right? Um, you know, there's an element of a reset that that happened there in terms of, um, you know, what, what people could do. Oh, I might have lost you here for a second. Oh, I'm still here. Oh, okay, sorry. I lost, uh, I lost my video for a second. There we are. Okay. Apologies. So, you know, as I was saying, COVID, I think... Um, it, it changed the scenario for me in that um, I, I traveled a fair bit for work. Um, I'm a, a VP in a private practice healthcare organization and, uh, you know, had two relatively younger children and, and, you know, entering politics really from a time management standpoint wasn't feasible. Um, you know, my children are a few years older now. What the oldest is a teenager. They're pretty independent. Um, and then COVID came along and I started working from home. So two things that, that align with that. One is that all of a sudden, you know, I, I've around a lot more. I've got time. I've got the availability. I've got flexibility. You know, and the other is that I'm immersed in my community. You know, instead of being away, I was uh, I was there. I was present. Um, we also, at the onset of COVID, it was horrible timing. My wife and I had bought a new home in Colwood. We'd moved from a neighboring municipality, and uh, you know, 
and really, really um, got ingrained in the community early it is a, a fledgling community. It's called Royal Bay. It's a, a large development area. And uh, we we noticed the change in in atmosphere. You know, previously in our, our, our old community and our other neighborhood, you wanted your kids to, to go out and do things with other kids. You made a play date and you called their parents, you set something up, a lot of vehicle driving involved. You know, in the community in Colwood, it's a much different family feel. And you know, I remember a moment where my wife and I looked out the window and saw, you know, a gathering of about 12 to 13 kids and their bikes just randomly stopped on the sidewalk. And, you know, I had that flashback of, of any kid who was raised in the 80s. or like, this is what it was about. You just ran outside and, you know, you were gone from sun up to sundown. And I thought, this is what a community is, right? And, uh, you know, long story short, I, you know, got active with the neighbors. There were some concerns in living in an ongoing development, some things that happened with some rezoning and, you know, amendment changes and things that, that galvanize the community around, hey, we need to do something. And uh, hey, I, I had the time, I had the voice and and really felt that, um, you know, I could make a difference. And uh, and that was sort of the start of it all there. So I want to talk about that election because we always remember the first time we see ourselves, see our name on the sign, see our name on the ballot. I can remember my first time in 2010 when I put my name on the ballot back in Ontario for a municipal election. And it's a surreal experience being that open and vulnerable at the same time because you're basically going around saying, I can I count on your support, not knowing if they're actually going to do it. So for you, what was that experience like? being the candidate, being the person on the ballot, on the sign, asking for support, because I can imagine it can be a little surreal from time to time. No, absolutely, Chris. And as you probably know, I mean, there's that that moment, like you said, it's a little surreal when you're driving down a main road and there's a sign with your name on it. You kind of go, whoa, this is real. But, uh, you know, it it really was. And I think my, my initial concern was, okay, look, you know, I, I was prompted to run by, by neighbors, um, you know, fellow residents who had been really kind of beating on my door politely, of course, to say, Hey, you know, you could do this. And, and we think you'd be a great voice for us. And, you know, part of me wondered, okay, am I in a bit of an echo chamber? Is it really, you know, is it just a small corner of the community and they want me to reflect their views? And I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I, I need to truly represent the whole community. Um, and I need to make sure that, you know, I've got the temperature right and I understand what the issues are. And you mentioned going out there and, and looking for support or knocking on doors. And, and I really, you know, took on a, what I would call a throwback campaign, you know, where I, I spent, you know, one of the, the, the smallest amounts of any um, candidate in the local election, um, you know, largely self-funded. I made a pledge very early on um, not to take any money from developers, to, to no one to take anything from construction folks, developers, not because I have an issue with what they're doing. They do great work in our community, but I wanted to truly be um, my own guy. I didn't want to be beholden to anybody. Um, and then, you know, in lieu of, of heavy advertising or anything else, I, I just decided I'm going to put a lot of kilometers on my running shoes and, and get out and door knock. And um, I went and visited every corner of our community, um, you know, the Flatlands, Triangle Mountain, we call it, which, you know, we definitely lost a few pounds doing that. Um, but, you know, I made a point of getting to everybody's door and saying, hey, what matters in your corner of Colwood? Um, you know, I know what's important in my area and my neighbors and I have discussed it, but what matters to you? And can I be your voice for Colwood? And, you know, and eventually that sort of morphed into my tagline is, is, you know, let me be your voice on Colwood Council, because I realized that, you know, each corner of the, the the neighborhoods, if you will, had their um, you know their their concerns, but there was an overarching kind of um, alignment in that people weren't feeling heard or they wanted additional transparency. And you know, and I thought, okay, I, I've judged that you know I've read the room well, and I think I can do the right thing by these people. Were there issues that came up at the door that you were not prepared to uh, even address because you didn't think it was an issue? Because we always, you talk about that echo chamber, right? That you think you know what the pulse of your community is. But when you go door to door, you find micro issues that people are affected day to day. So were there issues at the doorsteps that you went, whoa, I didn't expect that someone would be addressing this, but I'm glad someone is. So if, if elected, I will be able to address it at council. I, I would say, Chris, that um, it wasn't necessarily issues that I didn't expect, but certainly issues that I didn't have the depth of understanding in or understand, you know, just how deeply they penetrated, uh, you know, the, the minds of, of certain areas. So, for example, I'm a little bit spoiled in that I moved into a, a new development in, in Colwood. Um, infrastructure is a non-issue, right, with um, 
with new development comes sidewalks and boulevards and sewer hookups and all of those things you just take for granted. And, and in what I call sort of the legacy neighborhoods of Colwood, um, you know, you've got residents that have been there 30, 40 years plus, and, uh, you know, there was the visible issues in that, well, they don't have sidewalks and, and you know, they pay taxes like everybody else. So they're saying, why don't we have these, these amenities? Why can't our kids, you know, walk safely to school? And then the big one for me, Chris, was, uh, was sewers. It's not a sexy topic, <laughs> but, you know, this is a municipal uh, issue, right? It's a reality. And in our community, uh, we are behind the eight ball on, on sewers. It's, it's just one of those situations where Colwood was developed largely as a, as a subdivision or bedroom community of, of Victoria. And, you know, it's, it's got a long history of being kind of the source of gravel. There's all these old gravel pits through Colwood. So the, the ground is great for septic and many of the early developments were built with septic instead of sewer hookups. And, you know, now as you modernize, people want that. So the first few times I was confronted with that, I think I need to get educated on this. And where do I get this information? Then their biggest issue was we can't get answers from city hall. We don't know when we could get hooked up, what it would cost, how we go about it. And I thought, okay, you're right. I don't know a thing about it either. So, you know, I had to set out to, to find the answers that, that these folks needed, um, you know, for myself, just so I can answer their questions. And uh, for me, that was a bit of an eye opener. The biggest eye opening experience that I've found starting this series of municipal leaders is the fact that sewer and wastewater always comes up when I ask people <laughs> about issues, because it's not something most people think about until it happens. And municipal councillors like yourself have to deal with it on a day to day basis. It's such a unique municipal issue. But every municipality I talk to right now is talking about sewer and wastewater it's a very yeah, eye-opening right. experience i want to talk about though election night because election night you're the chips are on the table you've done as much as you can polls have closed count starts coming in you and i, I this is I, i'm just reading off of civic info from what i get gather from the british uh, columbia government but you come out on top you are the most successful candidate in Colwood, and you are the top earner of votes for councillor. What does that feel like? What does that feel like? Because you, this is your first time out. This is your first outing, and you beat incumbents, and you're a new man on the block. How does it feel when you get that check mark beside your name saying Ian Ward is now councillor elect? Well, Chris, and again, you've probably been there, but it's it's simultaneous. Oh, I've never been on that side where I get the check mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it really is. It's sort of this rush all at once of, you know, um, uh, of enthusiasm and, and you know, appreciation. You, you feel great. But at the same time, very humbling. You know, you realize that, wow, uh, this many people have, have put their trust in me now. Um, you know, I asked them to allow me to be their voice. And wow, <laughs> they, you know, they've agreed. And now I've got this contract, essentially, right, it, is that now the real work begins. So, you know, it's, it's a humbling moment. I think you pause and you take a moment to kind of celebrate and say, okay, you know, all this hard work paid off. But, but at the same time, there's that recognition that, um, you know, that there's a lot of hard work ahead because these people didn't put that tick next to my name to, uh, you know, just take a, a few uh, photo ops and, and new developments. And, you know, they want concrete action on, on sidewalks and sewers and roads and, and healthcare and other issues. So yeah, really a mix of, mix of emotions on that day for sure. I want to want to ask though, when does the moment go from joy to okay, now the real work begins. Now the decisions that I make are going to affect not only me, my neighbor, but everyone in my community. The decisions I make around budget, around finances, around garbage pickup, around planning and development are going to affect the city. When does that set in? Is it the first council meeting and has that uh intuition gone away coming up to 100 days in office no i, I think it, it really started the next day because for me you know a, a great piece of advice that i've heard along the way is that you know there's a big difference between campaigning and, and governing right and and you've got to be able to flip that switch and you know and i i took that to heart and i i realized that you know even in, in the heat of the election campaign you rub people the wrong way you know i've got to work with colleagues on council that you know, we, we may have had issues, um, you know, in the lead up in debates and things like that. So for me, that outreach sort of began right away. Hey, look, you know, we, we went at each other, 
you know, when we had to, but now we've got to work together. You know, we have the common interest of, of the residents of Colwood at, at, at heart. I think that's why we, we both ran, you know, let's look to, um, you know, define compromise where we can and consensus. I, I think one of the things, Chris, you know, as, as someone who does, you really enjoy politics and following it is I kind of lament the, I had the good old days where where there was a, it was a badge of honor to reach across the aisle, right? To to find some common ground with your your so called opponent, um, work together on something that you could both share and say, look, we did it. We came together. We found something that was in the best interest of the community. And you know, generally when I say that, that refers to higher levels of government. But even at the municipal level, you see a lot of slates and things now where it really becomes very partisan and. You know, I, I don't think that's the right way to govern. If you're in it for the right reasons, you shouldn't approach it that way. So immediately that was my first thought. It's okay, let's let's try to build some bridges or repair some bridges if need be. And, uh, you know, and, and try to remember what the, you know, the, the, the sort of overarching objective here is, which is do right by, by the folks that voted us in. You bring up a good que- uh, good question that I need answered for myself here, but the city of Colwell, Colwood, sorry, they don't have parties, right? I know Vancouver has parties, uh, Surrey has parties. Does the city of Colwood have parties, uh, parties that run slate candidates, or is it more the traditional municipal politics of all everyone's independent? Yeah, it, it leans more traditional. I mean, certainly there are some allegiances, you know, on, on either side. You know, the incumbents are sort of a group that work together with the, the former mayor and, you know, and some folks that were aligned under the would-be new mayor. But, uh, you know, generally pretty pretty nonpartisan stuff. Um, you know, we, we are surrounded, though, like our neighboring municipality, Langford, a slightly bigger city, very polarizing. Two slates, they, they ran the exact same sign, you know, one sign with the list of the whole candidates, and then next to it is the sign with all of the other candidates. I mean, it was as polarizing as as can be, but uh, I think fortunately in our community, people don't want to see that. They're not very supportive of that. They, you know, they don't have time for that. They see enough of that in other areas, and, um, you know, they we, we see a little bit more of that traditionalist kind of municipal campaigns here. So my last question before we turn to the city as a whole is about the, the the lifestyle of a politician, particularly municipal politician. You sign up for uh, to be a city councillor and you are paid as a part-time councillor, but you are on 24-7. If you go to the grocery store, you're councillor ward. If you go to the movies, you, you're councillor. If you go to a restaurant, you can't go out without being councillor. In your time as being a counselor so far, have you been able to find that work-life balance to be Ian when you're with your family and counselor when you're at events, but also if you're with your family, I'm only Ian at this event and maybe talk to me tomorrow to the people who come up to you? Yeah, I think so. It's um, it's a work in progress. You know, you're always trying to make sure that you you balance everything. Um, you know, but even leading up to the election or, or well prior to it in, in our neighborhood, you know, I was the guy that walks a dog and likes to stop and chat with people about everything from politics to weather to you name it. So, you know, that hasn't really changed. You know, you you recognize that you know, people are maybe looking for a little inside info or what's coming next or, hey, you know, what restaurants going in across the road. And, you know, there's an element of that and, and you've got to be maybe a little more generic in some of your responses and you know, a little less heated about, you know, issues that might emerge. But uh, generally speaking, I find it's pretty good. It's, um, you know, it's a supportive community. I think we're, let's face it, we're in a bit of a honeymoon phase here as well. You know, we elected um, four new councillors, a new mayor. You know, there was a bit of a sea change in the community that kind of a breath of fresh air. So, you know, I, I'd wager I'd probably have, uh, you know, another five, six months of, of this honeymoon phase before, I, you know, maybe I do have to change my mind about what time I go for a walk each day. But uh, no, I'd say, Chris, it's been generally pretty good. And, um, you know, no, no real concerns on that front thus far. So I want to turn to my next segment, and it's about the city. Before I ask this first question, I have to preface it because we always get questions and always get angry emails. This is a conversation between the councillor and I. This is not a motion at council. This is not a, a direction of council. This is his opinion. So if you're thinking this is what's happening at council, it's not. It's his opinion. Councillor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Colwood today? 
Well, in Colin, I think it's pretty straightforward. It's it's managing growth and making sure that that growth benefits all residents of Colwood. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, we are a, a very mixed community in the sense we have these these legacy neighborhoods, as I call them, that you know are underserved in terms of utilities and infrastructure. But you know, roughly a third of the community is brand new and under development. Still, we have hundreds of acres of, of development land that you know, master plan community that's going in right now. Um, you know, that's going to have the best of everything, right? And and so I think what we're facing right now is is development focus for sure. It's, it's very heavy on managing development, managing zoning, managing the official community plan, um, and then making sure that there's a trickle down. That you know, if, if we are receiving uh, you know, development fees from, from these folks, can we parlay that into something more for the folks on the other side of town and, and create that balance? Um, and, you know, and that's really our primary focus right now. When, when we talk about growth and we talk about uh, sustainable growth, there's always the nimbyism in the communities, people who just want their community to stay the, the way that it is. When you're out, when you were talking at the doorstep in the last election, did you run into that nimbyism, the not in my backyard, don't grow, I'm comfortable the way the city is right now? Or were people hoping for the fact that the city would grow in a sustainable way and not just explode overnight? I, I think historically, um, Colwood has been very protective of um, of what it is, and and you know for context, it's always been a um, like I say a bedroom community of of the city of Victoria. So, you know, people had retreated here to find more green space, larger property, single family homes, um, and for many years, I would say nimbyism kind of was the the rule of the land, right? It's uh, it it really. It had an impact on the tax base and the ability, you know, like when I talk about these legacy neighborhoods and having no sidewalks and things, well, there's a reason for that, right? We we said no at every turn to commercial development and other things that that now we need. I think what we're what, what's really great about right now is that the community is is now recognizing that okay, it's it's our time. If we want these things, we need to do more. The, the big change, I think, was in 2018, the, the revamp of the official community plan. It was um, uh, really an all-encompassing effort that brought in people, you know, every stakeholder, right? Developers and politicians and, you know, taxpayers, renters, students, you name it, seniors. Um, and everyone really bought in and it was a very community-driven plan. I know some OCPs are kind of just a tick the box, but this really has life to it right and people believe in it and it was a huge election issue and are people engaged in your community if you hold a public open house will people come out and actually give their opinion because as a former municipal communications uh, person i can tell you i've worked with municipalities that had no engagement to everyone and their mother wants to give you their feedback what's the average like feedback that you get in uh, the city is it high or is it on the average to low side I think we have pretty strong engagement. I, I think you're right. If you were to ask our communications person, she would probably say that she's uh, she's experienced the same challenges that you have. Um, and there's always a core group of people that that are, are regularly involved and engaged. And the challenge is how do you get the other 85% out? But, you know, we're looking at new ways. So, for example, just this last weekend on, on Saturday, we had what we call an ideas fair. It was an inaugural event to, you know, invite people to come out. We had a lot of city staff there that, you know, had large, um, you know, trade show type presentations on traffic and sewers and arts and culture and recreation. And, you know, we are asking people there for their input. What do they want to see? Do they want to get involved? At the same time, we've reestablished um, citizen committees. So we were, you know, had open invitations there with, you know, the application forms for people to get involved. And, you know, probably the largest turnout I've seen at a civic event in a long time. And, and I would say that certainly we, we are seeing a significant uptick in engagement. And I say that because if I'm being honest, I mean, one of the reasons I was elected is our previous uh, mayor and council really kind of set aside the OCP and said, hey, this is this is how we're going to do things um, and kind of shut down the engagement. There's an element of hubris and kind of a we know what's best. And, and uh, people were kind of tuned out, myself included. It, it was a, OK, well, you don't want to hear from us. Well, then, then that's that. You go about your merry way and we'll see you come election time. So, you know, I think we're seeing a resurgence of, uh, of interest in, at the municipal level in our community, for sure. 
speaking of the citizens of your community, if I go to Colwood tomorrow and I go talk to a hundred people in the, your community, they will each give me po- possibly they'll talk about infrastructure, possibly talk about sewer, but they'll also give me their unique issues that they believe is the most important issue to them, whether it be that sidewalk, whether it be that park in their neighborhood, whether it be a pothole in front of their house. When you hear micro issues, you have to gather all that information and present it to council or talk to the directors or talk to the CAO who talks to the directors and you have to give them that information. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to decide when it comes to budget, who the winners and losers are. And I hate saying the winners and the losers because it's not that it's always for the best of the community, but there, some residents are going to feel like they didn't get heard and their issue wasn't important. How are you going to balance that? Because you seem like someone who has the pulse of their community. You seem like you're an engaged person, but you know, and I know that every city does not have an unlimited budget in their (laughs) repertoire that they can go spend as much as they want. They only can collect a certain amount. Province gets some, and you only can spend a, a certain amount because you can't go into a deficit. How are you trying to find that balance of making sure everyone's heard but at the same time, making sure the city still goes forward and no one gets left behind. Well, I think you, you hit the, hit it on the head when you said, you know, making sure everyone's heard. And I think, you know, I, I, whether it's in the private sector business, you know, experience that I have, or, or now here at local government, um, communication is often at the root of, of most of the issues. And I think, you know, if we can do a better job of being transparent, uh, not only explaining, you know, that we're doing something, but why we're doing something or why we're not doing something. I find that goes a long way. I've had conversations with people who have said, well, this is important. We need this. And I've said, we can't do that. But let me tell you why. And oftentimes that's enough. If, if you can have that conversation with people and, and provide them with the information and the understanding you know, you're going to get a, a lot further than you are if you just simply cut off the conversation. So one of the things at the local level we're doing is is exactly that. We've held an open door service review on, on all of the services we provide through the city. The budget process is, is fully open to the public. Um, you know, we've tried to create sort of Coles Notes versions of, you know, this is your tax dollars. This is the breakdown. This is, you know, where each dollar goes. And, you know, you're not going to reach everybody, Chris, but I think if we can increase the awareness factor you know, by 10%, 20%, 30%, um, we'll get there. And, and I often, you know, when I see people critical on social media or anything else, um, you know, my first instinct isn't just to respond and go, oh, hey, you're wrong. You know, I'll reach out to them privately and go, let's get together for a coffee. I'd love to talk to you about that. I want to understand why they feel it is the way it is. And then maybe convey to them kind of what it's like from the other side. And, you know, and it's amazing what happens when you sit down in front of somebody, you can, you, know, you sure change the tone real quick. You certainly do. Um, what about provincial issues? Because the municipality is the frontline politics. You're the one that people will call on a regular basis if the water doesn't turn on, garbage doesn't get picked up, park isn't clean. But they may come to you and talk about, I need better access to healthcare in our community. We need better education in our community. How do you balance that? Because they don't care that it's a provincial issue, a federal issue, or a city issue. They want you, as their elected official, to fix it. Or try to fix it. Will you pass them off to the pr- appropriate person or will you directly take it to the next level of government and say, hey, MLA or hey, MP, we have this issue in our community. We need to address it. What what's the what do you do in that situation? Well, I think we're fortunate that, um, you know, locally we have a pretty good relationship with um, with our provincial MLA here, Mitzi Dean. Um, you know, she's been a strong advocate for the community. So, you know, we have no problem, I think, taking it to to that level because the communication is there, right? And I think that's, that first and foremost, you have to have that open door. Um, you know, again, I like to communicate to people where the municipal role is in some of these things, because as you said, oftentimes people don't know or they don't care. Like, well, what do you mean? It's government land. Well, no, it's not actually. It's, you know, it's property of so-and-so. But I think, you know, we do have a role as the advocate for the community or that bridge between the community and the next level of government where, you um, you know, we we have a mandate to to bring issues forward to to make people aware of what we're doing in that regard, and you know, put a little heat on the the elected officials above us too to say, hey, you know, the community needs this, and you know, we need your support on this, and and where we can, I think too, you know, 
I, I guess I liken it to, you know, in my, my private sector environment too, I always say to somebody, well, if you're bringing me a problem, ideally you're also bringing a potential solution, right? So we'll go to the upper level of government and say, okay, we have this healthcare issue. You know, a lot of it we can't do anything about, but look, we can work with developers in our community to ensure that we're, you know, freeing up office space. We're going to have medical office space for doctors. If you can get the doctors to our community, we'll find ways to extend breaks to them, um, you know, on housing, on office space, on, you know, support staff, whatever it might be, so that we also aren't just, you know, flipping the, the, the problem over to somebody else. We have to kind of take a bit of a team approach on it. My last question on this subject about the city as general before we move into the last segment is a more of a hypothetical question. Hypothetically, at the end of 2023, if I came to talk to you and I said, so Ian, how was 2023 for the city of Colwood? What, how would you answer that? And how would you want to answer that? What would you want to see move forward by the end of this year? So that way you can say, okay, residents of Colwood, we've got this on the books and we're getting it done. Well, Chris, I think I think any anything of significance starts with a good plan, right? And I mentioned our OCP, but that was 2018. You know, things are moving quickly in our community. So, you know, we're going to look at um, at some updates to that this year. And I think where I'd like to be at the end of, end of 2023 is that we've we've firmed up our plan and you know we've we've broken ground, so to speak. Like I said, we've got um, you know 134 acre oceanfront. Uh, development that uh, you know is is ready for for shovels in the ground. Uh, we have to to agree on a parks plan as part of the terms of reference there to get them to move forward. And so, you know, while I don't necessarily see a thriving community there by the end of 2023, I would like to be in a position where we know okay, we have a solid plan. We have community buy-in. You know, the stakeholders are are there. We found agreement. We found a way to yes with the development community, and we're starting to move forward. So that I know whether it's 2026 or you know, 2038 or whatever it is, we will realize the vision of this Royal Bay, Royal Beach area, which really is kind of the shining jewel of, of Colwood. Well, I will reach out to you in December of this year and see if that's how it is. But I want to turn to my last segment, and this is my... This is the fun segment. This is not the hard hitting questions about issues, but this is about tourism because as a tourist who is coming to the city of Colwood later this summer, so I will be in your community. So get ready to see me with my camera taking photos. What are, what should some of the tourists in Canada and across the world who are listening to this do if they visit the city of Colwood? Well, Colwood is a, is a waterfront community, and I think that's, um, you know, that's really our, our claim to fame is, um, you know, really temperate climate, um, you know, over seven kilometers of, of pristine waterfront, uh, you know, just beach, you know, one, each, each way you look, just beach as far as you see, and it's kind of bookended by a national historic site here, Fort Rod Hill and uh, Fisgard Lighthouse, so you know, old military fortifications that, you know, go back a century kind of thing. And, and just beautiful property, well-maintained, you know, the federal government does a great job on it. You know, and that feeds right down into, um, you know, a, a national bird sanctuary and estuary in front of uh, Royal Roads University, a uh, former military college here that's now a uh, private university, uh, but just spectacular waterfront. So, you know, it is sort of spectacular by nature, right? You, you can walk that beach and, and it's a relaxing community. It's the gateway to, you know, the, the West Coast. Um, you know, it's a, my, my wife and I and our kids will on a weekend. It's a 15 minute drive out to some very, you know, beautiful rugged trails along the West Coast as it starts to open up, you know, on, on Southwest Vancouver Island into the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, you know, we've got all of this on our doorstep. And I think uh, you can come here and just let the heart rate slow down a little bit and just take it in. So where do you go to decompress in your community, though? After a stressful day, after a long day at council, because uh, after, uh, prior to this recording, you had a three and a half hour council meeting. So I can imagine those are just long days for you. Where do you go in the community to decompress? And I got to say this because every councillor likes to say this. You cannot say your own house. You have to say somewhere in your community. So where in your community do you, do you go to decompress? Well, you know, in, in, in terms of just you know, got an hour to kill, two hours to kill, you know, locally, I, I just go for a walk in the park. And, and you know, we, we've got over 60 parks in Colwood. Um, green space, as I said, has been a, a real key in our community. There's there's a really a, a passionate undercurrent of people that, that want to keep our community green. 
you know, they're embracing density along the corridors and things where we need it. We're building up the transit, but, you know, we preserved a lot of parkland, a lot of, you know, old, old growth forest and, and uh, you know, and second growth forest, but that makes, you know, incredible trails just to wander through with the dog along a creek and, you know, emerge out right at the beach. And, you know, I can do a lap for my house, Chris, where I head out, I walk through really old second growth forest where you can see the old growth stumps with the ax cuts in them, uh, wander along a creek, emerge on a beach, walk along a pristine beach with nothing but ocean on one side, trees on the other, and then pop back up through a, um, a more developed beachfront area that's got food trucks and live music and things like that. So, you know, really the the ability to decompress, um, you know, in a short time frame, an hour or two. So, you know, you don't have to go far to find it, which is what's nice. Uh, it, you've painted an amazing photo, oh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it firsthand later this summer. But I want to end on this question, and this question you can take as long as you want to answer it or as, as little time as you want to answer this. But what makes the city of Colwood such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? That's easy for me, Chris. I don't need to take a lot of time. It's the people. you know. And I know it's cliche, but it's true. When I, I mentioned at the outset when, you know, when my family would re- relocated to Colwood, we were looking to kind of recapture that that community spirit what it's like to live in a community where neighbors know each other you know look out for each other um, and it, we found that i told you the story you know looking out the window and, and seeing the kids on their bikes and you know hearkening back to the the 80s where they just go out and play you just you didn't need to ask you just went over and grabbed your buddy and you went and uh and that extends all through the community like i told you i go for walks with the dog and i know the neighbors on a first name basis and you know, and that was well prior to even having any interest in politics. It just, it has that, you know, that relaxed community feel. And uh, I'll give you one more story. And this just happened last night on the way to the council meeting. And you may not have noticed, I managed to dry out, but I was heading, you know, council chambers are about 10 minutes from my house, driving in, in pouring rain, freezing rain, borderline snow. And as I went to turn onto the, the street where City Hall is, I noticed a car pulled over with the hazards flashing and, uh, and somebody on the ground with somebody over them kind of helping them out. And I thought, what's going on? And I used to have first aid ticket and everything. So I pulled over and I went over and, and unfortunately a, a young fellow sadly was having a seizure and he'd been lying there in the rain and a bunch of cars had gone by because it was dark and they hadn't seen him. And, and the individual there helping him who'd rolled him over in the recovery position. And it was our mayor. He was also on his way to the council chambers. He'd stopped. He was helping him out. And within minutes, there was a crowd of people. There was an off-duty corrections guard, a woman calling 911, people bringing blankets. None of us really knew each other except the mayor and I. But within about, you know, 10 minutes, everybody was there. The ambulance was on the way. And as the ambulance was coming, the, the fellow turned and said, hey, don't you guys have somewhere to be? And, and you know, the mayor kind of said, oh, well, I'm there. He said, no, I know who you guys are. You, you got to counsel me. Why don't you guys get going? Well, we're good here. And, you know, and that was it, right? They 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 were there to to take care of a, a fellow citizen in need and and that's the kind of community we have people will will help each other out now i know that would happen in a lot of places but how funny was it to you know have these people go no 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 it's a small town we know who you are you got a job to do go do it we got this covered you know it, it really spoke volumes about what Caldwell is it certainly does um counselor i wanted to take a moment and say thank you Thank you for a serving your community, serving Canadians, serving the people of the city of Colwood, but putting yourself forward. Uh, the, the city of Colwood is lucky to have you as a counselor uh, from our brief chat that we've had right now. Um, I look forward to visiting the city later on this year, maybe sitting down with you for a coffee if I'm, if you have time, but I, I appreciate t- you taking time out of your busy schedule and day to do this. It was greatly appreciated. Hey, thank you, Chris. Really appreciate it. No, definitely, definitely look me up if you're coming this way. We've got uh, a couple of hidden gems. You didn't even get me started on my craft beer hobby, so we'll. we'll oh, have a there's there's some somewhere. crafts. There's <laughs> uh, okay. I guess we. I know where we're going if I'm coming. <laughs> um, That's right. Exactly. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps your society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people. We'll be back tomorrow as we head to the city of Westmont, Quebec, to sit down with Mayor Christine Smith. Until then, talk to you later, everyone.